Hello. The purpose of today's Zoom session is to finish off yesterday's real ear, early real ear measurement procedures. I will mostly spend the time on the PowerPoint itself. Directing from the beginning, we'll review a few things we covered last week, and then we'll wrap this portion up so that next week in our Zoom session, we can get started on today's real ear. But it's really important to, um, to know yesterday's real ear because it'll help you figure out just what the true advances were regarding today's real ear. So I'm going to share screen here and get to that PowerPoint that I was just mentioning. And yes, I know I'm on Ozarks Technical Community College Zoom page. Oh, ah, there we go. So at any rate, we'll go to the very top slide here. Early real ear, yada, yada. And uh, I always show this picture. It always kind of baffles people. A bit of a, a, a cochlea thing. But then again, somebody told me one time, it kind of looks like a sea creature. <laughs> anyway, it's kind of abstract. But uh, I've always kind of liked the shiny 3D element of it. Looking at the uh, hair cells here and the tectorial membrane there. And this is my new book. Just got released. Chapter 5 inside this book is on real ear measurement. That was a significant piece missing from uh, the second edition, that kind of brownish yellow edition that's been out. Uh, that one came out in 2006. Now it's 2017, so it was high time. It's 11 years later. This book is also about 400 pages. It's double the length of the prior book, the previous book. So at any rate, that, um, actually, another thing that's weird about this new book is chapter one is on common clinical encounters. Hey, Sherry, how you doing? Good to see you. <laughs> Glad to have a guest on the show. It's great. Here I am talking to myself the whole time. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to stop sharing. <laughs> I'm going to stop sharing screen here. And uh, there you go. Good to see a familiar face. All yeah. right. <laughs> it's always better when someone shows. I was talking for about all three minutes or so. Just just starting. I'm off track of time. <laughs> ah, no worries. No worries. Oh crap. Oh yeah. And I actually oh, have today off. So yay. You did hey. All yeah. right. I had. A, I really enjoyed the conference. How about you? I did too. I yeah. did too. I think there was probably about 10, 10 of the OTC students. I think OTC is starting to make a bigger, uh, kind of a, a bigger splash at the conference. I think we're now kind of seen as a regular part of the conference. Yeah. So, uh, and I was just telling people too, I ha I'll share a screen here for a sec. I was just telling people that, uh, this, this new version of my book here includes a whole chapter on real ear, chapter oh. five. So it includes yesterday's real ear as well as today's real ear. So I'm really happy about that. When I came back from the MHS conference, there was a package at the door, and this is what was in it. Yay! So finally glad, to, uh, glad that that's kind of done. Um, I wanted to uh, ask you, do you have any questions in uh, regarding – real ear and stuff like that, that that kind of pick your brain or do you have any questions from last week's zoom session or stuff like that that, that you had seen or is there any, anything that came up that you wanted to ask now that we've got actually a live uh, guest here <laughs> not that i can actually think of good at the moment all right no worries later <laughs> okay yeah but i don't good know enough. I'll start gabbing away, though, from the top of the PowerPoint, and uh, we'll review a couple of the things that we talked about last week. But um, <clears throat> I'm always glad that in this course, I always review fitting methods in the first half, yeah. because I always find that a lot of students didn't retain or remember a lot of the stuff from the, the 150 fitting methods. So I'm always glad to, to kind of cover that again. And I really do think, too, that fitting methods and real ear are really tied together. They're, they're, the developments are really like roots, like two carrots that kind of grew twisted up. Yeah. So without any further ado, I will, I will uh, head over to that PowerPoint. Um, where are you living right now, Sherry? Are you in uh, Springfield or are you in yeah, Springfield? Yeah, I'm in Springfield. You're in Springfield. All right. What's the I'm weather like there today? What's the weather like there today? Actually, it's not too bad. A little chilly, but uh -huh. yeah, about the same here. 
We're kind of cloudy and overcast, though. That's typical for the West Coast in the spring. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I'll share screen and start with that PowerPoint that I've been uh, talking about and uh, move on from that page, if I can, if I hit the down button and the darn thing lets me. <laughs> Sometimes in Zoom, <laughs> it kind of gets stuck. And when I try to advance a slide, it's like I can't. It's really weird. Really? I wonder what that is. I'm trying to, trying to figure that out now. If I'm going to stop sharing for a second and try to advance the slide this way, and then I'll start sharing again. It's kind of weird. Okay. See if I can. Ah, good. I did it. Yay. All right. Page down, page down. All right, finally, here we go. I'll make that a, a tish larger. This here, this is showing, of course, real ear to coupler difference. Something that was, that was big at the beginning of uh, today's real ear. And I want to point that out to, to, to people seeing this Zoom session. Real ear to coupler difference. This is not something that was used much in early real ear. Although early real ear emerged because of the knowledge of this. You see, in the beginning, before real ear, and that was about in 1988, there was just ANSI. There was ANSI measures. So you measured what ANSI did, on a, what a hearing aid did on ANSI measures. And you, you knew that that wasn't typically what took place in the person's real ear. You just knew it. I mean, because a 2cc coupler is bigger than a person's real ear canal when it's closed off by a hearing aid. And so they, they, they would do experiments and they knew that real ear being the top and the, the hearing aid response in a 2cc coupler being on the bottom, okay, the closed ear canal is going to show more gain or more output because the closed ear canal is smaller than a 2cc coupler. So people knew that. And that's why they got into doing real ear because they said, hey, instead of putting the hearing aid in a 2cc coupler, let's put the hearing aid in the person's real ear and actually measure what's going on. But it wasn't, it, it, it wasn't incorporated so much in, in, in the use of, of uh, real ear measurement. It, they just knew that this was true, and that's part of the thing that spurred on the development of yesterday's real ear. Real ear re was seen as a huge advantage because now manufacturers' predictions are verified or proved as to what's going on. That software, like we said last week, gets you in the ballpark, but it's our job as clinicians to finish the job by proving that we're really getting what the software said we'd be getting. So a lot of times, and I really, uh, you know, next time I speak at uh, MHS, I'm going to hopefully maybe be able to talk on real ear again. I'd like to, but I always think it's amazing how many practitioners out there are not doing it. There's a lot of knuckle dragging out there. There's a lot of gorillas out there with their knuckles still dragging on the ground. They let the software do the talking and the walking, and they don't verify with objective measures called real ear. Why do you and think that is? Because it's, they say it's too expensive. They say, ah, uh, because they don't know how. They never were taught themselves. They may have had IHS training for that one-year thing that they had, and it just wasn't covered very much. They may have inherited the business from mommy or daddy, and uh, mom and dad didn't do it, so why should they? You know, it's a really, it's, it's amazing how many people don't use it, and it's, it's actually kind of scary because, <clears throat> like I said last week, it's like, saying, like a doctor saying to a patient, yeah, you might have cancer but not doing a biopsy to prove it. You know, it's kind of, we're in a healthcare field and we really should prove by, you know, because here we sit there asking, oh, how does that sound? Oh, how does that sound? What do you mean, how does that sound? Why don't you measure the sound that actually is coming in the guy's ear? You know, when you've got someone who says, the new hearing aids just don't sound like my old ones. 
and then you're sitting there tweaking the new ones and they're asking verbally, how does that sound? How does that sound? Well, why not measure what the old ones did in the guy's real ear and then set the new ones to do exactly the same thing in the guy's real ear? Now you've got some actual objective data to deal with. I mean, we are a science. It's hearing instrument science, yeah. you know? And too many people are just, you know, acting like good old boys just fit in here and aids, and they just kind of make the field look stupid at times. We make ourselves look dumb when we don't. And also, when you do real ear, you're showing your client that you actually have some objective proof. It, it, it's, you're looking more like a professional. Here's what software predicts. This is an example, a real actual example from a manufacturer predicting the, the, how the hearing aid is going to do. And when you look on the left, you've got three targets and mm -hmm. a matched to those targets, you can see <coughs> three predicted outputs. And then when you look at the right, you can see that, okay, that you're not, you're here near the target for the middle target, but look at these plus signs. Your hearing aid's response is here that I'm tracing right here. This is the hearing aid's actual response. And these plus signs are the target of the middle input, like average speech. Look at the left here, Sherry. You've got, this is a target for soft inputs. This is a target for average inputs. This is a target for loud inputs. And the software is saying, yep, you betcha, the hearing aid software is going to match those targets, no problem. Look at that. In reality, here's the plus signs for that same average input. And look at how far short you are of the target in the highs. Look at how far short. It's like... And not that you think, not that Moses came down from the mountain with the tablet saying, thou shalt hit the targets, but the proof is in the pudding. At least with real ear, you know that you are nowhere near hitting those targets. Right. You know, right, wrong, or indifferent, now you actually know it. So maybe the person's a new hearing aid user and you don't want to hit the targets. Maybe you want to have baby steps first by not matching the targets at first and let the person get used to the hearing aids and later on bump up the gain and output. That's cool, but at least with real ear, you've got some actual data to, to show what you're getting instead of, oh, how does that sound? You know, and that's the, what I find strange. So we talked about fitting methods last, you know, a couple of weeks ago, and we showed this slide saying sensory neural with its reduced dynamic range, plus all hearing aids that were linear, equaled the half gain method. And so linear fitting methods were based on that half gain rule, and we said the interesting thing is no method was proven to be the best, and the name to associate with half gain is Liebarger. But the half gain rule is still the spinal cord of all of today's fitting methods. And we said before real ear, this is what we used, functional mm -hmm. gain. And we used this for, look at on the right here, half gain, burger, pogo, libby, now are. None of those fitting methods are used anymore today. As we said a couple of weeks ago, it's all now one, NAL, NL1. NAL, NL2, and DSL5, but the point is, without real ear, you took the guy's thresholds, and I really want anyone listening to, to really internalize this point. You amplified the thresholds in a sound field. So you've, you've measured the guy's hearing loss with, with, with headphones on. You took the headphones off. You put the hearing aid in. And you remeasured the thresholds with the volume control set to a comfortable listening level. And you made sure that the aided thresholds were halfway up. And you did that because you were operating in the dark. Do you see what I mean? They couldn't visualize the end result. All they could do is say, hey, if we do this, then blindfolded, we'll know that this will be the result. If we do this, we know that 
this will be the result. But we can't see it. We're actually completely blind. I mean, I'm that that's they they were operating like with blind glasses on saying okay because speech is 55 dbhl or 65 dbspl if we amplify those inputs by the full degree of the hearing loss we're going to send the output into the guy's loudness discomfort level but the output is going to be too loud so the input of average speech plus the gain the, uh, matching the hearing loss itself is going to equal an output that's way too much. But they couldn't see it. They couldn't, all they knew was theoretically this is what happens. The beauty of real ear is that it actually shows that. So let me just now, I'll, I'll get my ugly mug out of this picture and go back to the, to the slide here. So here we go. And once again, okay, so today's real ear, this is what we're doing. I should say yesterday's real ear, this is what they did. And look carefully at this slide. There's four things on it. Whereas today's real ear looks very different. You had the target of your fitting method, the red, which may have been like the letter A's. The letter A's were where you wanted the gain of the hearing aid to set things. You wanted the gain of the hearing aid to be about so that the guy's thresholds were improved by half. So maybe this, these letter A's would represent the target of the half gain method. Maybe they represented the target of the burger method, the now R, who cares? If your letter A's did this, good, God was in his heaven and all was well with the world. So let's pretend that you matched the, the, that your aided thresholds matched where these letter A's are, great. Okay. Today's, or I should say yesterday's real ear took a turn and said the fitting methods didn't change. Half gain was still half gain. Burger was still burger. Now was just now. But here's the target calculated now shown on the computer. Because computers were just coming out. It was new. Computers were, I remember, it was, you had, computers were a great big box and the screen was this big, I'm going to stop sharing screen here. The screens were like these big boxes, like at least a foot deep. Yeah. And, and the computer was this ma this massive thing laying underneath. It was like, I mean, this, <laughs> yeah. you didn't have iPads and iPods and all that crap. It was a totally different scene. So, the big thing about real ear was, hey, the target is just like, bloop, it just calculated it instantly. All I did was bink in the audiogram, and then I chose, which fitting method do I want? Oh, I want now R. Boop, bloop, there's the target, appeared at the bottom of the screen. Then you put the tube in the guy's ear, and I remember doing this the first time I ever did this, hanging that loop over the guy's head, and then sticking in the tube, and I wasn't, you know, I was new at it. Bump against the guy's eardrum, ouch, you know. That's <laughs> not fair, and oh my God. And sometimes pushing in the tube and it's filled with wax, and you don't know it. So your whole real ear just isn't happening, nothing's happening. And I also remember doing the mistake of washing the tubes, like trying to reuse them. Big no-no. <coughs> Huge no-no. Once you use a tube that has to go in the garbage, because when you take the tubes and you put them in the cleaner solution, you know, that you put in uh, tympanometry tips, yeah. there's this vibrating kind of, all it does is it melts the wax so that it more evenly coats the side of the <laughs> tube. And it just actually makes it worse. You might have this thin tube, like this little toothpick here. And, but all you did was make the wax coat the inside of that tube completely, just beautifully. So now it works even worse. It's like, the, the, I remember being told and scolded by some real ear manufacturer that said, what a loser. Like, you, you cannot reuse the damn tubes. And then when that melted wax, if that gets into the receiver box, now you're screwed because now you have to buy a whole new new uh, new loop the the, the thing that hangs yeah. and those cost about 200 bucks 
So that that's the weakest link in a real ear system. I'll, I'll let's uh, I'll, let's just uh, show a little bit more of what we mean here. But the idea then is you slid that tube in the guy's ear and you measured his unaided ear canal resonance. And okay, now you can, you know that you did this at 55 just by looking at the screen, mm -hmm. because look at the low frequencies, they're at 55. You see, the outer ear canal doesn't resonate with frequencies below 1500 hertz. So 55 coming out of the speaker is going to be 55 measured in my ear canal at the end of that probe tip by the eardrum. So 55 in is going to be 55 measured for 250, for 500, for 1000 hertz. And then all of a sudden, 55 in is more. And then 55 in is even more. And 55 in is now 70 or 80. And how did that happen? Well, that was the resonance of the ear canal. So you've hit the ear canal resonance. And if the tube is put nicely almost to the eardrum, that resonance will hang on just past 4,000 hertz before dropping. But if the tube is not inserted all the way in, this will start to drop where my cursor is. It'll drop off mm -hmm. like crazy. So looking at the REUR is a good visual way of ascertaining without looking with an otoscope. It's a good way of proving that the tip is pretty close to the drum. Anyway, when the tube was held close to the drum, you made sure you inserted the hearing aid now on top of the tube without trying to move the tube and with the same input, 55, Oh, that's the cardinal rule when the, 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 the input had to be exactly the same. And now you're looking at real ear aided response. And then real ear aided minus real ear unaided was the actual real insertion gain, R-E-I-G. And if you were nice and close to target like this, you rubbed your hands together and said, knick knack, patty whack, give that dog a bone, I'm done. Okay, and then you talk to the client about the, the fitting and stuff like that. So basically, and now I'm running into this weird thing where it gets stuck again. I, was, I wonder what that is with, the, with, with Zoom. I'm going to have to phone. Ah, there we go. Now, okay, now I'll see if I, un yeah, here, I unjammed it. Good. Anyway, so the beauty of real ears, it lets you objectively see things and you don't have to rely on subjective verbal reports like we always used to. And it allows you to compare different fitting methods. You can instantly change. Like I could do this now. I could change this target here from now R to burger. And I could do the real ear again. Or I could do just change it to Libby. And then I could just see, oh, okay, how would, the, how would I be hitting targets there? So that's the beauty on that. But this is a, something I want to tell people who don't want to buy real ear. And this is something what... You may tell a client, I mean, you might tell a clinician where you are doing a placement. Maybe the, maybe the placement doesn't have real ear, or maybe the guy running the placement doesn't believe in real ear. Here's what you might want to tell them. Hitting targets isn't necessarily what a client wants, especially for first-time fittings, but right wrong or indifferent, real ear measurement allows you to see what the client hears. How does that sound? Only goes so far. And that's what Liebarger didn't have. In his day, they didn't have real ear. I love, this is a, a line from an, this is a slide from an HIS that I knew and still know in Ontario, Canada. I think this is hilarious. Just the way he, like snappy little answers. The equipment is too expensive. Actually, it starts at around 5,000 bucks. That's, that's what you make off the sale of two hearing aids, by the way. By the time you've sold a couple of hearing aids, you've made a, you've made a lot of money already. Starts at about three grand, I should say. Oh, I don't have to. Look closely at your bylaws. It's rapidly becoming a preferred practice. Audiologists don't have to. Well, imagine offering better services than them. I prefer to use client satisfaction scales. How this trumps, <laughs> that sounds like President Trump, how this trumps objective <laughs> measurements is beyond me. Why should I? My competition doesn't use it. God forbid you do better than they do. I actually listen to my clients. In other words, I'm so darn good, I don't need REM. Really, your measurement's a waste of time. Actually, it gives a lot of info for about 12 minutes time. Manufacturer software already does the work. 
see the rest of this presentation. Actually, one of our sessions near the end of this course is going to be a PowerPoint show where I show students from Conestoga College. I had them do a project and I had them show one slide of, of the manufacturer fitting software and then the other slide showing real ear measurement. And it would, it would show just how far off the mark the software really was putting people. And I had them doing that with case after case. And we're going to show that as one of our final Zoom sessions of this course, giving examples. So, but first things first, you're always going to do ot otoscopy. Always look in the ear canal because you're going to be putting a probe tube in. And you want to know if there's too much wax. If there's too much wax, you can't do real ear. If, however, you can see through the wax, if the wax is kind of coating the outside of the canal, okay, and I'll show you by example here, and I just will share a screen, or if you can look in a person's ear canal, and you can, if, even if there's a bit of wax kind of around the, the, the sides of the canal, but you can still see the TM, do real ear. You can still do it, okay? It's only when you can't see the eardrum. If you cannot see the drum, then bag off doing real ear. And if you can see it, try to work the tube over the mound of wax, and see you'll, I'll bet you you'll still get a fairly decent real ear response. It's just a kind of a, a something to say here. Now, another thing that you always have to do first is calibrate the system. And as you know, calibration, you, there's a reason for it and, and why people do it. So, Again, I'm going to try and unjam this thing. Oh, now it is stuck. Boy, oh, boy. There it is now. Unjam and hit this. Ah, trick the system. Always have to trick it. Okay, so here was an old, old real ear system. And it shows you where ANSI testing was done in the box there. And real ear, real ear measurements were done here. Most real ear systems encompass both ANSI testing and real ear. Look at this system here. See that big box? That's where you put the hearing aids in to do ANSI testing. The screen showed you what you got for your ANSI testing, but then when you did real ear, here's the speakers to do the real ear. Real ear basics, there's your speakers, and here's your loops for the right ear and the left ear with the probe tubes. And we all look at, let's make sure we really understand our probe mic assemblies. It's really important that we actually look at how, what this little box is and what each part represents. Calibration is done first thing in the morning. And when you look closely at the, at the system here, and every system is, may look a little bit different, but they're quite similar in, uh, in certain ways. Here's the loop that's hanging around the guy's ear, and here's the probe mic, and in this case, it's bent forward and stuck between these two little posts, and there's the reference mic. This is what's done to calibrate the system. Now, you're familiar with this, are you, Sherry? Yeah, we've got an Oracle. Excellent. Yeah, good system. Now, the thing is, look at this, this little loop here. That little loop is put 29 millimeters from the end of the tip. And how do you know it's 29 millimeters? Because that's the length of the box. The box is 29 millimeters. So if you lay the tube on the box, you'll be able to see right where you put the, 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 that little black loop. This is another picture showing you, okay? You're going to be putting the probe tube on top of the reference mic, and you're going to hold that box about 18 inches away from the speakers and let the speakers put out their sound so that you are calibrating. And the reason you are calibrating <coughs> is to get rid of the effects of the tube. And now when you look at, so you, you know that the probe tube mic is to measure the SPL at the guy's drum. You know that. But what's the job of the reference mic? What do you think that is? Why do you have this weird, what is the job of that? What does that do? Well, I think it's just there to, to well, it's to give a reference. For yes, it is. 
<laughs> always stay you're well you're right you're right i'm going to talk i'm going to say something here because you're but let's let's really expand the use of that when you're doing real ear that reference mic is there to make sure the speakers are behaving themselves in other words if you want 65 to come out of the speakers that reference mic is making damn sure is 65 coming out or is it 70 or is it 55 or 60? It's got to be. And you know what happens when you move that, that you say you've got that probe tube on top of the reference mic mm -hmm. and you're doing calibration. If you move that closer, guess what? The sound from the speakers is going to get softer. If you move it further away from the speakers, the sound from the speakers is going to get louder. Why? To maintain what you wanted, 65. Mm -hmm. And it's going to happen when the, if the loop is hanging on the guy's ear, too. You have the guy sitting a foot and a half away from the speakers, mm -hmm. 18 inches. If mm -hmm. he moves closer, the speaker sound mm -hmm. to make sure that 65 is hitting. So that's what the reference mic is there for. So now we'll, we'll look at this. And that's why I really want people to understand the reasons why you've got these little pieces and parts. So the, the, the reason for the probe mic is to make sure the sound at the, at the tympanic membrane is what it is and to measure what that sound is. And the, the job of the reference mic is to make sure that the sound from the speakers is what you set it to be. The probe mic is there to measure what actually is at the drum. The reference mic is there to make sure the speakers are emitting the sound that you wanted. So if we go forward here, and now again, I'm going to try and trick the system here. So you have to do for some reason with Zoom. Here we go. So here's a picture of the probe tube. And this is actually out of my book. This is now a picture that's in Chapter 5 in the new edition of Compression for Clinicians. I've shown the, the thing laying down on its side. And here's the thing on top of those little posts to do calibration. But note where the tragus ring is. Look where that ring is. And now look at the box. See how the box is 29 millimeters long? Well, I've laid, when I laid this tube on top of the box, the length of the box helped me put that tragus ring right there. When I had the tip of the tube right here, okay, then right where my cursor is, when I had the tip of the tube right there, I knew then I could put the cursor ring right here. So now when I do my calibration, there's where it is. So that I've got the tip of the tube now over top of the reference mic. I'm doing calibration, and I'm doing calibration to get rid of the effects of this tube. See that tube here? Mm -hmm. That's in a closed ear canal. That's going to affect the sound. And I want to need, what do you call it, uh, get rid of the effects of the tube in the canal. That is why, that's how come you calibrate. The reason you're calibrating in the morning is to get rid of the effects of the tube inside the guy's ear canal. So if any question is asked, why do, you, why do you calibrate? How come this has to be done in the morning? To get rid of the effects of the tube. How do you do that? Well, you lay the tube on top of the reference mic, and you hold the whole mic system 18 inches away, right where the guy's head's going to be. Let the sound come out of the speakers. And now you are canceling out the effects of the tube. All right. <clears throat> on some systems, calibration might look like this. On other systems, a successful calibration will look different. It doesn't matter whatever you're using. If you're using the Oracle, it's going to show you a different display for successful calibration. Follow what the Oracle does. This slide is showing the effects of not having the tube close enough. This slide, if you're looking at the bottom, you can see centimeters from the tympanic membrane. And if you look at the vertical, it shows you the dB of loss as your probe tip is moved further away from the drum. So if you're looking here, Look at the further away the probe tip is from the eardrum, look at the effect at 8,000 hertz. Huge, a loss. 
at 7,000 hertz, at 6,000 hertz, at 5, at 4, at 3, at 2, at 1. You see what I mean? This, this slide is showing you the effects of the, pr the tip of the probe tube. How does it relate to the, to the eardrum? If that tip is not, if, pretend this is my drum, the mm -hmm. further my tip is away from the drum, the more my real ear unaided response is going to drop off, drop off, drop off. Where? At the high frequencies. That's the idea of it. So that's what that, that slide is showing you. The effects of probe tube placement are going to be greatest in the high frequencies. And you can see that as the vertical axis here, dB loss as the probe tube is moved further from the tympanic membrane. So there you go. That's another slide. Now here again, I gotta, I gotta beat the system by making the slide bigger. Ah, did it. Hit escape, <laughs> make it smaller, and advance the slide. Yeehaw! Okay, so basically, the idea of that tragus ring being 29 millimeters from the tip Okay, that means that the, when you put the tube in the guy's canal and you have the tragus ring at the tragus, you can automatically deduce that the tip of the tube will be at the person's ear canal. And we'll show it to you this way. So here's that length of the box. It's 29 millimeters, just about an inch. You're going to put the probe, that, that, that ring, about an inch, about 29 millimeters from the tip of the tube. And now you know this. And this is the slide of importance. When you hang the loop around the guy's ear, and you make sure that little ring is at the tragus of the ear, you can have comfort and satisfaction of knowing that when that ring is at the tragus, the tip of the tube, looky here, the tip of the tube will be within five millimeters of the guy's eardrum. And that's one of the basics of real ear. Now, have you guys been doing this much in your labs with real ear? Have you done much real ear? Uh, 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 no. Okay, that's why I think this is very... That, that we haven't done it. Okay. So that's why I'm, I'm, that's why I'm, 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 what do you call it, explaining a lot of this very, very thoroughly so that people really internalize this. So that, that placement of that ring ensures that the tube tip will be nice and close to the guy's eardrum, but not touching it. It'll be within five millimeters. Any questions? Is that, does that make sense so far? Yeah. Good. Okay, great. So the length of the mic assembly box, 29 millimeters from the tragus, ensures that the probe tube tip will be 5 millimeters from the tympanic membrane, as shown here. Okay. Now we can move on. Here's an actual photograph of the tube tip in the guy's canal with that little, with the little ring at the tragus. Mm -hmm. Terms encountered in yesterday's real ear. There will be six, five of them here. These things are all very quizzable type of items. We got to make sure that we understand them precisely. So R-E-U-R, R-E-A-R, I-E-R-E-I-G, and real ear occlusion response, R-E-O-R, and real ear to coupler difference. So here we go. R-E-U-R. The real unaided ear canal response. The output at each frequency measured in the open ear canal for a specific input sound. And how was it done? This is also, I almost think of this like a lab. Just almost think of this like a lab. First look in the guy's ear. Sit the client a half a yard away from the front of the speaker, 18 inches. Put the probe tube, hang the loop around the guy's ear, put the probe tube with that tragus ring as we described. Choose your input level. Now, let's talk about yesterday's real ear, because this is kind of important. What they did, okay, I'm, I'm, we're on this slide here, and I'll show this to you right here. 
Choose an input above room ambient noise level. This would usually be about 55 dB SPL. That's why they chose it. What's ambient room noise? What is that in dB SPL? What is that? I don't remember. About 40. Ambient room noise when no one's talking, just the creaks of the house, whatever, about 40. So that's why they chose 55, because 55 was more than 40. So then they would present the sweep tones or the noise. Every time I see sweep tones, I think of a broom. But it was actually, <laughs> which meant low, mids, highs, low, mids, highs. And then the oracle, I'm not sure what kind of stimulus it uses. It might use a broadband. <laughs> So they, they all differ. They use different kind of stimuli. But at any rate, the use with the old real ear, you chose about 55. And then you measured the resultant REUR. And it was done as a reference for sub subsequent gain measures. You, that's how you got your real ear insertion gain as required for some fitting methods like now R or Libby or half gain. It represents unaided SPL at or near the tympanic membrane. It represents unaided SPL. That's the reason why. So let's just make sure we pop this up here. It is done as an anchor for all further methods. It's the very first thing done. And it was always done at around 55. And we'll talk about that for just a second to make sure we get why. Here's a picture of, uh, of, of, of some actual REUR from some subject. And have a look at this picture here. Everyone's REUR is a little bit different, but this one's not bad. Look at it, it picks up past 1500 hertz. That's an earmark, so to speak. And it peaks at around 2,700 hertz. But this guy's got twin peaks, one here and one here. Doesn't matter. That's just his canal. But notice that it only drops off past 4,000 hertz. And that's how you know it was a good probe tube placement. And look at the red circle here. You can see by the red circle here, this is saying that the input was 55. So you knew that the unaided REUR was done at 55. Now here's my little view of REUR. And this is a salient thing that we should always memorize about REUR right here. This is a generic picture of it. 1500 hertz is where it begins. The peak is usually around 2700 hertz. And at 4000 hertz, it's still there but then it begins to drop off. Do you see that? And that, and then how much dB do you get from that? Well, if I take my cursor here and I move it over to the left, you can see it's around 20. You can see that the mountain is about 20 dB high. So knowing what to expect when you're looking at an REUR, this should be a, like a visual giveaway as to what you're looking for when you're doing an REUR. And your REUR comes from rather complicated bunches of things. Look at this T for total. Can you see how that T for total on the top looks an awful lot like the prior slide? So here's your previous slide right here. And now when you go to the next slide, T for total, this looks quite similar, doesn't it? But it actually comes from all these things, the, the, the resonance of your concha bowl, number five, the resonance of your ear canal itself, number three, the pin of phalange. <laughs> I mean, look at all these weird parts of the ear. If I, if I stop sharing, we'll look at that slide. It comes from this little ring, from that little ring, from the concha bowl itself, from the side of my head and the ear canal combined. All of those things together give you that R-E-U-R shape, and that's why I call it T for total. And that T for total looks an awful lot like the prior slide, as was seen. Now here we'll get sort of, let's see if I can unstick my, ourselves again. Gosh darn, this I read this is a real weird, a weird thing that happened. Ah, good, I hit home. When I hit home, 
I can sort of escape out of that. Okay, let's bring it down here. It's weird, little ghosts in the machine here. No worries, we're all good. Okay, and so by the way, when looking toward today's real year, okay, and this is just something I want us to tie together, really important. This slide unifies a few things, even from acoustics. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, here's ear canal resonance, that total ear canal and concha resonance that we looked at before, top left. When you look at the top right, you see that? That's the resonance of your middle ear. So when you take the resonance of your outer ear left and add that to the resonance of your middle ear, you get this yellow smile. And that yellow smile can represent either of two things. It's going to represent minimal audible field. Do you remember what that was from acoustics class? What's the softest it takes for a normal hearing human to hear all the different frequencies at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears? And you'll notice that our hearing sensitivity isn't as good for the lows. It's really good between one and 4,000 hertz, and it's not as good at 8,000, right? Mm -hmm. And then all these differences are built into your audiometer, aren't they? Because this is called minimal audible field with two ears, and then they do it again with one ear, like under, under a speaker, and that will be minimal audible pressure. And the curve will look fairly similar, okay? The curve will look fairly similar, but the point is these differences are calibrated into your audiometer, and so this curve becomes zero dB HL on the audiogram. Do you remember uh, covering that, Cherry? That was yeah. uh, that that's something way back from acoustics class. So anyway, and when 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 you get to 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 today's real ear, you're going to see that a lot at the bottom. I'll be covering that again. We'll pass this way again next week when we look at today's real ear. Anyway, this is the funny thing here: when you plug up someone's ear with a hearing aid, mm -hmm. this resonance is gone. So this, this is outer ear canal resonance, and it's showing you that here's a hearing loss, but when you've plugged up the guy's ear, look, at you've lost that resonance in addition. So the hearing aid has to make up not only for the hearing loss, but also for that lost outer ear canal resonance because you damaged it because you've plugged it with a hearing aid, so that's gone as well. At any rate, the second measurement of yesterday's real ear was real ear aided response. And then, of course, how it was done. This slide is just showing you how that was all done, which is all pretty straightforward there. Keeping the guy sitting where you had him, keeping it at 55 dB, ensuring that the probe tube didn't move very much. And looky here, the fourth one from the top, turn the hearing aid to the volume control listener to the to what the user would like use the same input level as you did for reur and run it again and basically real ear aided response minus real ear unaided response gave you real ear insertion gain how it was done subtract reur from reaar across the frequencies now your real ear equipment did this for you. You didn't do this. It just did it automatically. And so you would see it. So real ear insertion gain is the difference between REUR and REAR at each frequency. Now it doesn't tell anything. Look up at this. Look what I'm highlighting right here. The trouble with yesterday's real ear is precisely this. What's highlighted here? It tells nothing about the audibility of speech. Nothing. It's just a picture. And let's look at that picture again, just to make sure that that's inside. Here's outer ear canal resonance. Here's a picture of it. Mm -hmm. Speaker emitting sound. Here's the tube. What's wrong with this picture when you look at it? Just look at where that 
what's wrong with the, with this picture? Can anybody tell me when you see that? No, the tube placement doesn't look close enough. You got it. It isn't. At any rate, here's the tube. Here's the sound from the speaker. That's going to give you your R-E-U-R. And then you plug it with a hearing aid. Same sound coming from the speaker. You're measuring what's, up, what's happening at that tube. And then R-E-A-R minus R-E-U-R gives you the insertion gain, R-E-I-G. Okay? This is the essence of yesterday's real ear. This picture comes from my book. No bias in me. It's all in, or in my family. It's all in me. Well, let me blow this up for you. I almost don't dare because things will, will freeze up again. But have a look here. I show it this way. R-E-A-R on the left minus R-E-U-R on the right gives you insertion gain. R-E-I-G. Here's a real example of it. R-E-A-R minus R-E-U-R is going to give you the real ear insertion gain. And look where the numbers are again here. 55, 55, you can see 55 with my unaided, 55 with my aided. Okay, and I even highlight that in the right-hand column here. Note, input of 55 was used for both measures. Very important to internalize. Have a look at this slide. It's showing you a real example from a real person. Yesterday's real ear, early real ear. R-E-A-R minus R-E-U-R gives you your real ear insertion gain. And you're nice and close to target. So you rub your hands together and you say, guess what? I did a good fitting today. But now look here. This is... What does this tell about the audibility of speech? And have a peek at this. I'm, I'm serious. If you're counseling a client and you're saying, yeah, your hearing aid is doing the right thing, where is speech shown on this picture? And where is speech shown on, on see, here's yesterday, here's functional gain, the first way we did it. You can't see this. This is what Liebarger hoped for. But he couldn't, he couldn't see it. Remember, we talked about operating as blind in the blind. Right. But even when we went to today's real ear, and let me go to this slide here. Now we will leave functional gain because this aided speech output was the hoped for result, but you couldn't see it. And then we went to today's real ear. Let's go here. I want to just show, go to this slide right here. Go to today's real ear. And look at this slide. You got R E U R. R-E-A-R, target, real ear insertion gain, but capital B, capital U, capital T. Where is speech on here? What does this tell you about how the person benefited with the hearing aid? What was unaided speech ability and what was aided speech ability? It isn't shown here. All you've got is a red and a black line that are pretty close. So if the clinician is asked, well, how do I know what my husband's going to hear without the, with the hearing aid? You can't see it. Well, I'm hitting target. Well, what does that mean in English? I don't know. Research shows that if I do that, your husband's going to hear speech really well. But how do you, it is, you can't see it. So early real ear sucked eggs when it came to counseling. It was even worse than showing this. Because this, at least, at least it shows an audiogram. At least it shows the guy's hearing thresholds. And now you're showing what your aided thresholds look like. This doesn't show everything. It's missing a piece. It doesn't show the green here. That's what you hope for with your heart, but you couldn't see it. But that's the reason for the season of lifting the guy's thresholds halfway. Because when you know you've lifted the guy's thresholds by half, if you add half the, guy, the gain to the input of speech, the output will nicely sit in the guy's residual dynamic range, which is what you want. But later on, real ear, when you got really early real, that didn't even show the audiogram. You saw nothing. So your heart was in the right place, and your methodology was quicker with early real ear. But here's a big problem why people began to reject 
early real ear. And this is what I want to show. Look at this yellow line. R-E-U-R. Is that used in the hearing test? I'll stop sharing here. Is R-E-U-R used during the hearing test? No, because you're plugging up the ear with a headphone. As soon as you cover the ear with a headphone or jam an insert headphone into the guy's ear, R-E-U-R is dead. So if you didn't use R-E-U-R in your hearing test, then why in the Sam Hill are you using it in your hearing aid test? And that's why people said to real ear, to, to early real ear. They said, R-E-U-R, why? The, the only reason you'd ever want to keep R-E-U-R is if you were testing the person in a sound field. Let's say you were having the guy raise his hand every time he heard a tone from speakers. Well, then your R-E-U-R is being used because you haven't plugged up the guy's ears. Then it's fair to, to use R-E-U-R. But if you're covering up a guy's, you're jamming an insert headphone in an ear canal, you've ruined that R-E-U-R. It's gone anyway because you screwed it up. And I'll finish our little, a little talk here with a couple slides that I kept jumping over that you might have seen. And that's why I'm going to just highlight those here because I think it's good. Oh, boy, here we go. I'm going to hit home again. There we go. Unjam the system. Yeehaw, I love beating the system, knowing how to. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's a, it's a really weird little bugaboo, but it's kind of humorous, really. Okay, here we go. Let me go to this slide here. Look at the, I'm going to go here. Okay, look at this, what we saw before. Look at the bottom two curves. Minimal audible field. That's the way you hear with one meter distance from a speaker with two ears. That's your hearing sensitivity across the frequencies as shown in DBSPL. Okay? Now, if you have your PowerPoint printed up, you'll see the slide at your, by, by live yourself too. But here you go. The yellow curve represents the sensitivity of your ears of a normal hearing person at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears. What's the softest it took for the guy to just barely hear all the different tones in dBSPL? We all know the definition of zero dBSPL. What's the softest it took to hear a 1,000 hertz tone at one meter distance from a speaker with two, with two ears? Now let's play that same gain at all the other frequencies. And what you end up with is that yellow line, minimal audible field. Now, look at the white one. The white one is minimal audible pressure. That means what's the sensitivity of your hearing, but this time with one ear under a headphone. Okay? That's the difference. And if you're looking at with one ear under a headphone, it's not going to be quite as good, is it? If I stop sharing, one ear isn't a, two ears are better than one. Mm -hmm. And look at that little bump in that white one too. If you look at the weird little bump, you'll notice it goes up where the MAF does not. Look at this. Well, you know why? Because you've lost that resonance. Look where it's taken place between 1500 and 4000 hertz. You've plugged up the ear with a headphone. So that's why you've got this little gap here between the white and the yellow, okay? But nonetheless, the point I want to take home here is that MAP, MAP, and I'll stop sharing here again, MAP is, capital letters, bold-faced, italic, underline, is 0 dB HL on your audiogram. That's what it is. So those differences, Across the frequencies seen in MAP, these are built into your audiometer, literally built in, and that's calibrated. Look at this, at 125, it's 40 dB. So 40 freaking dB SPL is 0 dB HL on your audiogram. Okay, that's the differences, but I really am trying to highlight a bunch of this stuff. And today's real ear always shows MAP at the bottom.
because today's real ear, you're looking at things in DBSPL. And so normal hearing is shown as a smile at the bottom of the screen. Anyway, that's where we've highlighted that and we can now kind of move on to where we think we can go. <laughs> if, my, if my computer screen will let me, and here we go, jammed, ah, unjammed again, beauty. Okay, great. So ask why we hear some frequencies better than others, or why are equalizer buttons shaped like a smile, like this, because of the resonance of our outer and middle ears. Minimal audible field, minimal audible pressure. Look at the bump caused by the loss of REUR when plugging an ear up with a headphone. You guys, when you get out of this class, you are going to know middle ear better than many of your supervisors will at your placements. That's the idea. I'm always after getting behind the whys and the how come so you really get it. And we're not a bunch of push button technicians doing it because, well, that's what you're supposed to do. I want people to learn what's behind. So at any rate, that whole thing of these curves are caused by the red and the blue here, the resonances of your outer and middle ears. That's what gives rise to the fact that we actually hear some frequencies better than others. But always remember that that red MAP, that's the line that's built into your audiometers, and is that red is 0 dB HL. At any rate, real ear measures emerged in the late 1980s. <coughs> that means... That means it's 1230. That means it's quitting time. <laughs> you got it. So I am about to end this, but we've covered, I think, what we need to cover in order to get what's happening. You know, really your occluded response, I'll just finish with that. R-E-O-R mm -hmm. is just measuring what's going on, but with the hearing aid turned off. So now the hearing aid is a plug in the guy's ear. So if you look at this picture here, here's R-E-U-R. Here may be the guy's R-E-A-R. And look at R-E-O-R. Well, that's because you've plugged up the ear. Why did they measure R-E-O-R? They did it to tell the effect of venting. It was to tell how well the vent was working. Okay? If the hearing aid was working, if the vent was working really well, then real ear occluded would look just like real ear un -ear, unoccluded. Okay? If the vent was working, this line would be right by this line because you'd have a big hole in the hearing aid. So mm -hmm. REUR would be preserved. If the vent wasn't working very well or if it was a tiny vent, REOR would fall below. Not commonly measured, the big four the big four were these guys right here. R-E-U-R, R-E-A-R, the difference, real ear insertion gain, how close did you get to target? Remember, real ear didn't change the fitting method targets. The fitting methods were the fitting methods were the fitting methods. It's just that instead of using functional gain, where you had little aided thresholds above the guy's unaided thresholds, you stuck a tube in the guy's ear and measured things quickly. And it was called insertion gain instead of functional gain. Hearing aid fittings had three chapters. And I'll fi uh, stop sharing. Hearing aid, yeah, hey, hey Sherry, I'll stop sharing. <laughs> Hearing aid fitting methods had three chapters. Functional gain, early days, prior to 1988. Early real ear, from 1988 to about 1998 maybe early 2000s, and then what we're going to next week, today's real ear. Functional gain, early real ear, today's real ear. We have to know the first two to appreciate where we're going next week. All right. Any questions? Um, no. Go Not for it. If you have any, go <laughs> for it. If you don't, we're good. We're all good. It doesn't matter either way. You let me know. All right. I will. <laughs> okay. Anybody have questions? You can phone me at home as well as email me. Okay. My phone number is seven seven eight four three three nine seven zero seven. Call me any day except Friday. All right. 
Fridays, my better half and I, we usually take a holiday. We try to anyway. All right. Adios. Live long and prosper. We'll see you next time. We'll see you when we look at you. All right? Thanks, Dr. Rama. Okay. Bye-bye.